Um, so my name is Gary Fleming. Um, I started my career as a software developer, um, and then for about 10 years I ran my own consultancy as an agile coach. Um, then I got really bored of that, and I went back to development, which was quite nice for a while. Um, it was good to kind of get back and get my hands dirty and, and you know, build things for real rather than just talking about telling people how they might think about possibly building something, you know, what agile coaches do. If there's any agile coaches in your room, you know that the whole job is just saying, hmm, it depends. Um, <laughs> I wanted to actually do something. Um, and that was great. And then uh, my org uh, needed someone to act as an agility lead. So this talk is called Let's Begin Diving Into Discovery. Um, it's about discovery and what I learned working with a whole bunch of teams over the 10 year period. So it's, it's specifically about two teams who I'm not going to particularly mention, um, who had superficially similar goals, but had to take very different approaches to how, how they were going to approach product discovery. I have to put this up. Um, none of this is about my employer's opinions. Um, in fact, none of this happened at my current employers. This happened before. So take that into account. They are not to blame for any of the silly things that I say. So let, let's start by trying to figure out what discovery actually is. You know, if we're, we're going to spend 40 minutes talking about discovery, it probably helps to talk about you know, what it is, why you would do it, and what shape it takes. And by shape, I mean, is it like a formal process where if you do A, then B, then C, you've discovered? I mean, if it was that, it probably wouldn't be a 40 minute talk, so it's probably not that, right? So it's good to start with a definition. I like this definition. So this definition comes from um, GDS, the Government Digital Service, and it's from their user manual on service design. So they take a slightly different approach to what I would assume many of you do. I'm sure some of you do service design. But uh, they, they, everything they say should probably apply to most product, mo most of the work that you do do. So I would say that discovery is about learning about your users and what they're trying to achieve, because if it's not about that, then I, t I really don't know what it is. But it's also about the constraints that you're going to face. Sometimes that will be legal. Sometimes that will be technical. Sometimes it can even be interpersonal. Um, there are constraints that exist in the systems we're trying to build that we should learn about if we're going to go and build those systems. Um, it's about the underlying intent you've been asked to address. So if you've been asked to go and build a service to do X, it's important to understand why, because the reason behind it might not be quite what you think. And going and interrogating that can be helpful. And it's also about opportunities to improve. Just very simply, how do we improve things? So it also starts with this. This is the first part of the GDS uh, service design manual on uh, d discovery. Before you commit to building a service, you need to understand the problem that needs to be solved. I mean, that seems pretty simple and basic stuff, right? But I want you to focus on the two most important words here for me. Before and commit, right? Discovery is fundamentally an act of product assessment and risk management. That is why we do discovery. It's so that we can learn enough about the thing that we're trying to build so that when we build it, we have managed risks that we're knowable up front, that we are building the right thing, that we know what's possible anywhere, that we know what's possible in our context, that we might find out what value is, what might succeed, what we might fail. It's risk management. Fundamentally, those things are about risk management. A lot of product design is about risk and understanding. So you're, you're really trying to figure out two things. You're trying to figure out outcomes. You know, where, where are we going? Where are we headed? What, what could good look like? And possible space exploration. So I don't mean like you know, NASA or you know, SpaceX or anything like that. I mean, if we have a solution space, we've got lots of different solutions that we could go for. What are the ones that we should start looking at? There's probably a whole bunch that we should not even go near. But which ones are the ones that are more dispositional to achieving the goal that we have? Now, use the word dispositional there. So let's go on, go on a slight aside, because the word dispositional comes up quite a lot when we leave the basics of agility. Once you leave some of the simpler tools like Scrum behind, this word pops up quite a bit, and no one bothers explaining it. So I'm going to explain it to you. So dispositional simply means it leans in a, a, a direction of an outcome that we want. So it leans in a direction. That's it. That's the whole thing. 
You probably want an example though, right? Everyone likes examples. So imagine that you want to make a hit blockbuster movie. You've got, uh, you want to have a decent sized budget. You have, you, you maybe uh, make a miscasting and cast someone who has never led a major action film before and you give them a bad script and a questionable IP. That outcome is dispositional to fail, right? This, we remember this quite recently. I mean, Morbius, uh, Jared Leto, good actor. I mean, I know some people don't like him very much, but I think he's done some excellent work. But he'd never led a major action film before, um, and the film did not do well. It lost quite a bit of money. Um, then they tried to re release it, and it lost more money. So. Not, not a good choice. That said, if you find the right sort of charismatic unknown actor um, and you give them a proven IP within the framework of the most successful cinematic project ever undertaken, it doesn't matter that they're unknown, you can still help them succeed. Yeah? Like Tom Holland was unknown at the time he became Spider-Man and that still succeeded. And that's helped him ha help help make other projects he's been attached to have the disposition of being likely to succeed. So Uncharted on pen and paper maybe was not the best adaptation they could have done. Yeah, if you've ever played the Uncharted games, they went quite far from what that should have been, but they attached Tom Holland and they attached Mark Wahlberg, who are both very bankable, and the Uncharted film went pretty well. That said, Tom Holland is not a guarantee. These things are dispositional. If you put Tom Holland, you can take Tom Holland and put him in a film with Daisy Ridley, who also led a massive uh, franchise in Star Wars. Doesn't mean it's gonna succeed. Who saw this film, Chaos Walking? Anyone? This is the highest I've ever seen. So in the room of like a hundred and a bit people, uh, three saw this film. This film came out last year. This is not an old film. It got no marketing, um, <laughs> it really didn't do much. It's a bit weird. Um, and it lost $80 million. So Tom Holland is not a guarantee of success. It, it's dispositional. Now, here's a second example. I, and again, I'm speaking for me, no one else, I'm disposed to say that SAFE is a mostly misapplied framework that large consultancies sell to big companies uh, to make them feel safe, that uh, their money is going somewhere to make change when really it's just selling the same old rope again and nothing's actually gonna happen. Now, I'm disposed to say that, but I do occasionally sometimes say it's the right thing for certain companies in certain places. Maybe if they're in chaos and just need some sort of structure, then it's the right thing for them. And I'm sure if any of you are doing safe, you're doing it in the right way for the right reasons, right? You all love it and it's perfect for your, your individual circumstances. So. Dispositionality is an indicator. It's not a guarantee, it's a direction, a likelihood, something that we would prefer to happen. I'm gonna be stopping for tea every couple of minutes because I've got a fairly sore throat and we don't want it to dry up. So where were we before we went into this aside? Before you commit, yeah. So I mean, I, I, I've seen teams committed to deliver services way before they knew what was gonna happen, way before there were any noble outcomes. In some organizations, that's unavoidable. There are political aspects to organizations that mean that they're never going to get away from, from this sort of commitment. Managers who promise the world and can never deliver because the thing is essentially impossible. There is no getting away from that. What we can do as product owners, developers, coaches, whatever your role is, is we can learn. We can get a bunch of data as fast as we can about outcomes that we can put forward and say, I don't think your plan's gonna work, which may or may not be taken well. Or better, we can say, your plan's great, but let's take this slightly different branch and we've got more chance of success. Yeah, Th this is something we can do. So let me reiterate, data and ideas are the way out of a bunch of bad situations. So what are we gonna try to learn? We're gonna learn what we need. We're not gonna try to learn everything up front. The possibility space is far, far too big in most subjects to learn everything. So you're not going to be able to do that, even if you wanted to. I'm gonna put it to you, there's really only four categories of things that you need to learn, four, that's it. And we can argue later, if you like, about other things that you think are super important. Um, this is just my idea. So, 
I think fundamentally you need to understand the domain. You know, your, your fundamental trees, lakes, rivers, whatever make up your picture. Because if you cannot talk coherently using the words of the domain, then you cannot think in the domain. And if you can't think in the domain, you're not going to act in the domain, and you're going to go wrong pretty quickly. Right? The further away you are from speaking true domain language, the harder it is going to be to even grasp of the ideas that are available to you. Now, sometimes that can be beneficial, but more often than not, it's not. To give you an example, imagine that we are going to build a hill walking application. Right? That, that's our product. I'm going to come back to this example a few times. So we're going to build a, 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 an application that gives you hill walking routes. The domain there might be ideas like tile sets. That's all the little squares you see kind of load in in Google Maps if you've got a slow enough connection. Those are tiles. They exist at different levels, different kind of parts of granularity. Those are things you need to know. You need to know about routing algorithms. You need to know about geometry. You need to know about all sorts of other things that exist in that domain. You don't need absolute knowledge, but you need enough to start thinking coherently so you can have conversations. And I think it's important if you're going to start talking about the domain that you uh, pull in ubiquitous language. So this is a concept that was popularized by uh, domain-driven design um, by Eric Evans. There's parts of it that kind of existed before that, but that's certainly where it was popularized. So the idea here is that everyone continuously uses the same words for the same things. So you stop saying stuff like map square, and everyone starts talking about tiles. You stop talking about uh, shapes of things and start talking about geometry. You stop talking about paths and start talking about routing. Now, it doesn't really matter that much which ones you pick. I mean, it's probably better to stick to industry standard if you can. But everyone in the project should be speaking the same language and help build this ubiquitous language so that you're always talking about the same things and you get coherence. The second thing you need are goals. So this big green area up here is where we want to head. Now, you notice that this is not an X in the ground. It's not a single point because, especially early on, we don't know where we're going. We know roughly we want to go in that direction, but we don't know exactly where we're going to be. So there's lots of possible spaces and nooks and crannies up there to kind of indicate that. So we might say um, we, we, want to, uh, we want to build this hill walking app, and our main focus is going to be bagging Monroe's. There are hills in Scotland that are over, I think, 3,000 feet, uh, some certain height off. Um, I've probably got that wrong. So if you're a Monroe bagger, I'm sorry. But maybe that's your main thing. Like, I want to be able to bag Monroe's without going into many big descents. Like, I don't want to go down a thousand feet to come back up another thousand feet. That's tiring. Um, you then might say, another thing we're interested in is, is country hikes around the hills rather than the hills themselves. So I want to see them, but I want to go do the uphill part because um, that's the hard part. And if you can see the big, beautiful thing, then maybe that's enough. But there's a big space of possible goals we could go after. Equally, there's a bunch of stuff we might say we're absolutely not going after. Yeah, there's stuff where we might say, if that comes up in conversation, we should just leave that. So stuff like detailed urban centers. If you're building a hill walking app, you don't need the city center of London, right? There are very few hills. Yeah, you, you don't want to do that. You don't need to know stuff like cafe opening times or, or menus or anything like that. that. That would be the kind of thing that a very general application like Google Maps might have, but our specific hill walking application probably doesn't care about that. So we, we can say, no, we're not going to do that. And then we have to explore. We have to try things. We have to go and do lots of little experiments to find things we think are going to work, things that don't work, pathways that customers are absolutely not interested in, things that are too hard to go after now but might be good later. We have to explore. Having a bias to action and experimentation is very helpful for doing this sort of stuff. And it helps us build our roadmaps, which we'll come back to much later in the talk. That's towards the end. Now, I said there's four things. The complication is you have to do them all at the same time, over and over again, in a loop. Right? You cannot just do A, B, C, D, done, because they inform each other. Knowing about your domain will help you understand the kind of things that are in your goals. Knowing where your goals are will help inform your, um, your uh, possible exploration, Exploring stuff will tell you stuff that you're not going to go after. Knowing where you're not going to go after will help you explore more of the domain. These things all interconnect in a way that you cannot predict up front. So it cannot be an ABCD process. It's 
it's dispositional. You're going to try certain paths and then learn and loop over and over and over again. Right, so that's a lot of big, vague words, right? We've not gone into any detail there. It's a big idea, but it's not, it's not really telling you what you can do. So what can we do? So you're busy. Does, does Discovery have a process where you can just do it like a naive version of the Scrum Guide, A, B, C in your ceremonies, and you're done? No, no, it doesn't work like that. Or, or maybe it does. Maybe there are a few little things that we can pull out that would work well enough. So for me, effective agility, and this is what I've said through all of my roles, effective agility is about arming yourself with tools. It's not about following a big process, whatever that big process might be. It's about arming yourself with tools, putting them in your tool belt, your toolbox, whatever metaphor you want to use, and then trying them. Bring them out at the right time and seeing what works. Being honest with yourself about what doesn't work. Getting feedback and then trying to improve it. And I might mean that you create your own new tool that's specific to you and your situation. I think that's great. That's far better than taking something off the shelf that doesn't quite fit. If something off the shelf fits, then please go ahead, use those tools. So right tools, right situation for me. And there are processes in the discovery world that you can take off the shelf that are very useful. So I mean, a really popular one that comes up every time somebody starts talking about discovery are design sprints. Who's ever done a design sprint? OK, like a, a decent number of hands. Um, I want to say I'm not going to uh, make fun of design sprints. I think they're very, very useful, but they're very context specific as well. So if you've never heard of des design sprint, it's a five day process where you get everyone in your team together and you do these things one per day. So you map out the problem. Um, what are the thing what's the thing we're trying to achieve? Well, let's get together and make sure we're aligned and you may inject the main language at this point. You, you're you're going to kind of go through that. On the second day, you're going to sketch uh, individually, go away and sketch competing solutions. So everyone tries to come up with their own solution to the problem. That means that you're not getting bound by uh, groupthink. You're not going to get pulled down into all solving the exact same problem in the exact same way. You're going to have variation. Then you decide. You decide on, you use various criteria that are explained in the book. Sorry, I should have said the book's called Sprint. Uh, it's by a guy called Jake Knapp. Um, you use the tools in the book to decide which ones you're going to go forward with. Sometimes that's one, sometimes that's two, that's fine. You build a couple of real prototypes in the fourth day, and then you test them on the last day, and then decide, did that help? Did this solve our problem, the thing we were trying to solve at the start? And that's great. It's, for me, though, I, I think it doesn't work that well unless you have small or well-understood problems. Now, if you have small or well-understood problems, great. Use design sprints. That's a good tool for doing that sort of thing. If you can break your big problem up into lots of small, well-understood problems, again, useful tool. Use it. I have no issue with that. But what if you have a problem where you really don't understand it, and it's big, and it is chunky, and there's mystery, and you know it's like an iceberg. There's something underneath there that you don't really understand. I think something like Kinefin can be a really good lens for exploring that. Um, it's 10.52. I think this is the first mention, mention of Kinefin in the conference. Um, so somebody note that down, get it on Twitter. This is an important measure of any Agile conference these days. Has anyone heard of Kinefin? OK, not many. Does anyone use it practically? Whoa, the hands are up, but they're very wavy. Like, uh, practical, maybe? I don't know. OK, that's fine. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to explain much about Kinefin itself. That is not my intent for this. Uh, the idea will we'll, we'll explain just a touch, um, because Kinefin is a whole talk by itself. I have to warn you, though, that if you go off on your own and learn about Kinefin, you're exposing yourself to um, complexity thinking. And complexity thinking is a horrible gateway drug to learning more about the reality of the world. Um, you don't need that in your life. The world's already really complicated. So handle Kinefin with care. Speak to a professional if you get your hands in chaos. Avoid it if you can, right? Just be very careful around Kinefin, because it will mess up how you think. That is my excuse for why I'm currently like this. Um, so Kinefin's primarily, primarily a sense-making tool. It's for helping make sense of the world. It's not a categorization tool. It's not about putting things in these boxes. It, it's not about that. It's about how you put, put 
things onto this and then move them around. It's about the dynamics of the board. It's about how you take things from one place to another and why you would do that. Again, I'm not going to go in deep into uh, Kinefin dynamics just now. It's just important you understand that little, little nugget. In fact, I'm going to simplify this quite a bit. And I'm going to just get you to think about two, two real things here. So, Kinefin has two sides. The right-hand side, which is ordered, and the left-hand side, which is unordered. Things that we think belong in the right-hand side are things that we know that are knowable, that we can apply rules or expertise to and get some sort of answer, right? So we, can, we, can, we know it well enough that we can examine it, we can evaluate it, we can process it, we can turn it into training. You know, we, we could write down all the rules and then give it to someone else in the room and, say, and they can say, yeah, I get this. Like they can then go and operate it by themselves. So stuff on the right-hand side is simple. So in our example, we might know how to lay out map tiles as an example. We might know exactly how you put these things down and then how you switch between different tile sets as we scale up and down so that are kind of less fine-grained. Yeah, we might, we, might, we might know how to do that. I mean, you might not, but the person in this theoretical example might. And I put it to you, if you have something like an order process, then something like design sprints are perfectly fine for that. Or something like user story mapping is good for that. So user story mapping is a great tool. I, I'm going to just cover user story mapping very briefly, but user story mapping is a great tool for stuff that you know, things that you already know how to do. So the idea is that you individually go away and break down the problem by yourself. So everyone in the team says, I think the problem is da 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 da. It's these 10 things or these 15 things. And everyone will have different answers. That's good. That's what we want. We then get all the things together in DGIP. So if people have written down the exact same thing, we get rid of the duplicates. We then group by some sort of theme. So if something, if we have a, in our hill walking example, we might put all the stuff that's about uh, entering where you are in, in one sort of column, in one group. We might put all the stuff about how you, uh, how you lay out the tiles in one group. We might put stuff on routing algorithms in one group. Yeah, things that are related, we group, and then we name the group. Then we try to order the groups left to right by time, so earliest in a user journey to the, uh, to the right, which is latest in a user journey. So we might have, how's the user going to come and use this? They're going to come into our site, we are going to load the, map, the initial map tiles, or we're going to ask them for an address, depending how we set this up, of where they want to go. Um, so we might say this is a kind of finding location. We might say that this is loading map tile sets. This is routing. This is X, Y, Z. Yeah? We, we kind of work through how a user might approach our, our system. In each of the groups and the things that we attach to that group, we prioritize by this is the most critical thing to this is the least critical thing. So absolutely essential to maybe kind of interesting. And then finally, we draw this MVP line, which I appreciate is very low on the screen here. Hopefully, you can see it. And everything above that line, stuff we say is essential, stuff that absolutely has to happen, or else the system's unusable. And that's usually a good place to have an argument. Like, argue this up as high as you can so that your MVP is as small as possible. And that, that can be quite useful. That can be quite useful. Importantly, you, know, you don't have to know absolutely everything. You don't have to know everything. If, as you go through that, you might say, oh, actually, we know nothing about ring algorithms. You can just put that in as a question just now and work on the stuff that you do know how to do. And then when you come to those things that you don't know how to do, you can treat them as unordered, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So the left-hand side of Kinefin is unordered. So this is where this is where we don't know an answer. Like, we couldn't just hand it to some, a, a training guide to someone else and they could just do it. It's about how we can evaluate and explore heuristics. So we can come up with heuristics for things without really knowing how we're going to do them. And I appreciate that's like a very abstract thing to say. So in our example, the routing algorithm, so how you get between two points, maybe we don't know what makes a good route or exactly how to implement the best possible route around Monroe's, or Hills, whatever you want to do it. But we can, come up with, we can come up with a heuristic that would help. I could say that it's... It's minimizing distance, right? I mean, that, that feels like a good written algorithm heuristic. Whichever thing we end up making should be the, and use should be the thing that minimizes the distance walked. But maybe then you put in a second heuristic that's like, 
but also it shouldn't have rapid descent. You know, if, it suddenly, if the route suddenly drops a thousand feet, maybe not survivable, maybe not the best route for a hill walking app. So we can find these little heuristics and then put them together to a value, to use as an evaluation for solutions that we then come up with. So we don't know how we do the routing, but we can evaluate them. And that's important. So what do, we, what do we do with those heuristics? We experiment. We try a whole bunch of safety field probes, so stuff that's not going to get somebody hurt. So you, know, you don't actually go and get somebody to walk around the hills and then fall off a cliff. Right? That's, that's not safe to fail unless you really don't like the person. Um, that, that, that's fine. Let's uh, zoom in and enhance. So you can see up here, I've got this sort of branching pathway structure. We can go and try a whole, like actually building a bunch of these uh, experiments, in our case, the written algorithms, and see how they go. We might say that this one is the one about distance, and our initial distance approach doesn't work. So we're going to just scrap that. Then we find about a star mapping or you know, some other routing algorithm, and we find some other possibilities that do work. And then we've got their distance ascent, and we learn some stuff down here. We try a whole bunch of little experiments that kind of branch away from each other. We get rid of the stuff that doesn't work, but we've learned from, and then go on from there. Eventually, we've learned enough that we could actually go and do this. Yeah, we, we've used your heuristic to learn, and then we can apply that to, to kind of move it forward. So these possibilities here are the ones where like, these have succeeded. They might actually now be ordered. We might be able to take them to the right-hand side of our Kinefin diagram. And that's the kind of dynamics we're talking about. We might have said, you've learned enough. This is safe. We can, we can then work from there to make it more ordered. Now, it's important that whatever we end up doing to build our product and do this sort of stuff, that we, uh, we pick the right tools to apply. We pick the right tools. Because if you were to use that experimental approach that I just described, when you already know how to do it, then you're going to waste a lot of time. Like If you already know how to, collectively as a team how you do the work, and you just need to get your heads together so that you can learn those things, don't experiment. Don't experiment at all. It's going to really slow you down. And likewise, if you take uh, an approach like design sprints or user story maps to something that is far too big to be knowable or that you don't have current knowledge of, you're going to be really frustrated. Because the main thing you should be doing is learning, not doing. You should be go out and try to learn how to something. Because if you go, go down that path, you're going to fumble, you're going to feel lost, it's going to lose morale. It's a horrible feeling. So apply the right thing at the right time. And you don't have to apply the same thing. You, know, you can split these things up. You can use both. And if you decide to go down a user story mapping approach initially, and you find there's big chunky questions in there, go split that off into a bunch of experiments that you're going to go and do. And likewise, if you take the experimental approach and you suddenly go, oh, yeah, no, we know how to do this now, put that into the user story map. The two approaches should inform each other. One should ping the other, which, which should go back. But also, don't allow yourself to become paralyzed by indecision. Like, move forward. It's really easy to get caught up in experiment and experiment and experiment until you do nothing. It's important to have some bias towards action especially if you're face, uh, facing a customer-facing role and you have to you know, put stuff in the world so that you can make money. That's, that's fine. Have a slight bias to action if you've got any doubts. Now, you're all busy people, and your customers are angry. They want results. They want dates. Uh, they want roadmaps. They want deadlines. And that's completely understandable. Of course, the paying people want answers. That, that's fine. I think it was uh, Jess Godelf who said this, um, organizations struggle because, they because the delivery work is valued more than the learning work. And Jeff is right. Only doing is a recipe for waste. Because if you do without learning, you're going to do the wrong thing. It has to be a bit of balance of both. And that has to feed into your roadmaps. Now, I'm here to let you know, good news, you can have both. In the same way that we did uh, ordered and unordered approaches to our experimentation and discovery, we can do the same with our roadmaps. So let, let's inspect the roadmap metaphor for just a second. I, is anyone old enough to remember having an actual roadmap, like you know the book your mum had in the back of the car? Yeah, like a, a bunch of hands, like just a book full of things. The thing you'll notice about it very quickly is that roadmaps 
have a bunch of different pathways you can go on. It's not just, here's one way to go. I put it to you that a roadmap that doesn't have options in it is a road. It's just a road. <laughs> and if you're delusional enough to think that one road will suit everything or that the road's right in all cases, especially where you don't know, that's not going to go great for you. Now, if you do know exactly we are going A, B, C, D, and this is going to be perfect, and there's not going to be any traffic lights, there's not going to be any roadworks, no one's going to stop in the middle of the M5 because they're protesting fuels, uh, fuel rises. Cool, good. Um, if you can do that, then build your road. Great. I would say maybe we want to take a slightly different approach. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you approaches for ordered roadmaps and unordered roadmaps. So first off, um, let's talk about now, next, later. So now, next, later is one of these classic road mapping things where it's presented as a road. We'll do these things now, these things next, these things later. I'm going to encourage you to do it a little differently so that you can have conversations even when you're doing ordered work. This diagram's a little confusing. I've been trying working it to make it better. Uh, it's not there yet. So you've still got now, next, later along the x-axis. The y-axis has a value, yeah, value going up as you go to the origin, yeah, the opposite direction from what you might think. So the most valuable and most urgent stuff is here, and it gets less urgent and less valuable the further up you go, yeah. If you build your roadmap like this, where you put it on two different axes, you can have a more meaningful conversation about the why you're doing things at different times. It's very often you see a stakeholder say. This is urgent. And then you look at it and it's like, oh, I mean, it's urgent to you, but it has absolutely no value. If we do it, we're not going to you know, win big. Um, and we can also talk about, like, well, how are we going to actually achieve and deliver this stuff? If everything's in this bottom quadrant down here, this bottom sort of section, we're not actually going to be able to deliver anything. We want, lots of, we want um, small, well-understood pieces of work in now, and then we want bigger, chunkier bits of work higher up that we don't care um, as much about now. And eventually, things will move in as we learn, but allows us to have conversations about the trade-offs. Now, if you've got an unordered roadmap, a strategic roadmap uh, can be a bit more, more useful. So if you don't know what you're going to build, you might take this kind of approach. So this is a strategic roadmap. And if you've never read one of these, it can, again, be a little confusing, but the, some parts of this should look kind of familiar. The big vertical lines, D1, D2, and D3, are decision points. These are points at which we know that we have to learn something by. That by the, point, by the time we get to that point in time, and that could be a, a hard date, or it can be a soft date like quarter's end, you know, wh whatever that is for you, we need to know enough to make a decision. Th this should be informed by strategy. If your boss has come along saying, we need to know something by then, that should come from a strategy. You put those dates into those decision points, and then you run a bunch of experiments. You put the experiments we talked about earlier onto this map in this sort of branching pathway style so that you're learning the right things at the right time or by a certain point in time. And if you can look at this map and go, I don't know, actually this thing we need to decide it way further back, you've got to visualize. You can then have a meaningful conversation about it. A lot of these tools are about that. They're about having visualizations that allow you to have conversations. The tools themselves are not the important thing. The conversations are. Now, this gets a little messy, but you can also overlay the two on top of each other. And if you've got a strategic roadmap about your decisions and a now, next, later roadmap, an ordered roadmap about the work you're doing, you can start to then go, are these coherent? Are the questions that we need to know later being answered by either the experiments or the concrete work that we're doing? Are we going to learn things in time? Are we going to know what we need to know before the car crash comes? And again, you can have these meaningful conversations about our trade-offs, our, our dates, uh, how, how all this hangs together, and update it over time. Now, the last thing about discovery is, when should you stop discovering? A lot of people see discovery as a phase, something that you do once at the start, and then you learn enough, and then you stop. Again, I would say that's probably contextual. Um, some problems are done when they're done. They have a finite lifespan. You're going to learn the thing, do the thing, commit the thing, and you're done. 
But a lot of other uh, modern problems, especially for doing product design rather than project design, are long-lived and changing. Um, some things should be in discovery in perpetuity. They should really never meaningfully leave discovery. Um, I, I think we should aim for the early and continuous delivery of valuable software. I mean, this hopefully sounds like a familiar part of a statement to people at this conference in particular. So rather than worry about when discovery should be done, worry about that bias to action thing I talked about earlier. When have I discovered enough that I can put some value in my customer's hands? and then try it for real and get value from putting things into production. Because that is a form of discovery. Like putting things into a real life environment is, to be honest, the only true and meaningful test of discovery. Either people are gonna like it or they're not gonna like it. They're gonna pay you money or they're not gonna pay you money. They're gonna give you your data so you can resell it to Facebook and other data brokers and make your money that way if you're you know, that kind of person. No, it's, I'm not judging. You know, we all have to make a living. But that's the only real way of knowing this stuff, by doing. It's only by doing that we can actually do this. So I wouldn't worry so much about when you stop discovery. I would think more about how do we start delivering based on our discovery. And then maybe, maybe your project starts to boil away when the solution is finished, when you've mined all the possible value from it, when you think that the cost of continuing to do the work outweighs the increased benefits you're going to get. For me, that's it. So stop when you've produced the understanding of the product that you're ever going to need, that's ever going to lead to more customer value. Stop when it's done. So let me summarize a wee bit. I said at the start that there are four things you need to know to learn. So that's the domain, the goal, exploration, and what you're not going to do. It's important to understand the work that you're doing, whether it is ordered or unordered, and use that to inform what you're then going to do, whether uh, you're going to build uh, whether you're going to discover using ex experimentation or knowable tools like user story maps, or whether you're going to use strategic roadmaps or um, ordered roadmaps, and you now know when to stop, which is try to keep learning till you don't. But the secret summary hidden in all this is that discovery is best when it's optional, when it has optionality and dispositionality hidden in it. I mean, you can notice that the first slide with the wavy paths and the experimentation slide and the strategic decision-making slide all look kind of sim similar because they're built in options rather than certainty. And I, I, if I can t get you to take anything away from this talk, it's that, that you don't know what you know. Even if you think you know what you know, you don't. Like the, those roads that we've seen in so many plans, we know they fail. We know that they don't work. We know that they're hidden, hidden costs and hidden be benefits. And yeah, maybe we're the kind of organization that just puts our fingers in our ears and plows on and ignores the, you know, the stop signs that suddenly appear. Um, I would say don't do that. Build yourself a learning machine, a discovery machine that builds optionality in what you want to do. Now, I'm going to stop when it's time to stop, which is now. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think the question was, when, when do we switch from uh, you know, pa pen and paper prototypes like in, in stuff like Figma, which are excellent design tools to really doing? Um, I, I'm going to um, you know, go back on what I said earlier and say it depends, um, because it does. I mean, that's why Agile coaches say it. Um, it, depends, it depends on whether you've learned enough. I mean, going, going to start to do product delivery, you know, just going ahead and building a website. Like if we went ahead and built this hill walking application I've been talking about without any prototypes, it's going to be bad, right? Because that is a very specific tool. It has specific user needs. We have to think about uh, things like accessibility. We need to think about all sorts of things that keep people safe. And it helps to design that up front to some degree. Now, at some point, we have to switch over and actually do it for real. 
the biting point for, for you and your tools is going to depend on the domain you're in, how safe it is to move forward, whether you're running out of money, whether you think that you have enough, just enough, that you can put something forward, and it's not going to tarnish your reputation by not being good enough, and it is maybe going to give you enough to learn a little bit. It depends. Does that help? Uh, as I say, uh, this talk is not about my work at JP Morgan. In fact, I had to put a disclaimer in to say that. Uh, no, no, it's fine. Um, but we, I, I've done it in other places. So the hill walking example is not a randomly picked example. I used to do consultancy for another company who I'm not going to name, but who are in the broad mapping and land space. Um, and we, we use these techniques in various different ways. Um, so stuff like design sprints are actually tools we used because we had a bunch of problems that were the right shape for that. But we, we knew that our, our, wider, our wider set of goals, we, we were mired by decades of technology and decisions that we, we had to live with. So we used stuff like strategic roadmaps to say, well, look, if we want to change our, our approach to X, like our, big, our main big product, if we want to change our approach to X to achieve goal Y, we need to design a bunch of experiments to figure out how we get there because everyone here has got an opinion, but we literally don't know how we do it. Like we, we don't know how we do it. So l l let's think of 10 different approaches and then try a bunch of them at once for uh, you know, three weeks a month and then see what we learn, see what we combine, see what we can do. Um, I, without going into the detail of the companies I did consultancy for, because I, I try not to do that, I'm happy to have a conversation uh, in person at some point. Uh, it's basically just what I was saying, like try the things, like actually go and do, fight, figure out a way to do an experiment. Does that help? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Okay, so the, the question is, how, how do you, and especially big companies, uh, wh how do you help teams that are solving problems that help solve the problem that help solve the problem? Um, I, I, would, I would try to avoid having those teams, frankly, um, because most of those things should be more closely connected to the actual problem. Now, I appreciate some, some, for a bunch of political reasons, that's not necessarily always possible. I would say that stuff like that kind of visualization helps. If you can put together a strategy roadmap or a now next letter roadmap that ties a specific team's work to the overall vision, it helps inform the why. So th those teams that are remote struggle because they can't see why their work matters. Or they think it's just a thing in isolation and don't know how to connect it to the overall uh, company's goal, their strategy, their product. And I think that's really important. Like, I, I think we need, to, uh, we need to connect intent to outcomes and outcomes to intent. So there's a great tool in the, a book called uh, The Art of Action by Stephen Bungie the art of action, uh, where he talks about briefs and back briefs. So if you say that you want people to go and do a bunch of work, so you, you say, Here, here's the, the strategy we've come up with, we've turned this into a bundle of work, you send it out, you make sure that the people hearing it are hearing, hearing the right reasons, and they can connect it back to your strategy. So you get them to tell you what they heard, and you get this sort of virtuous cycle of, I meant this, oh, I think you mean this, and you're like, no, 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 I meant something else and then you get to have a conversation. Everything should be connected. If you've got teams out there that are disconnected from your strategy, from your goals, it's your fault that they're failing. So, you know, have those conversations, build that feedback loop. Uh, so practical hints and tips for seeing how experiments work well. Um, yes, um, so yeah, the, that's a pretty big topic by itself. But briefly, I would say, make sure that the goal of the experiment is well understood. If you're building heuristics at the start, make sure the heuristics are tied to the goal and everyone can look at it and go, yes, I understand how that is tied to the goal. When you then go and do the experiment, time box them appropriately or scope them appropriately. So either in time or in cost or whatever scoping you need to put around it, put it around it. Um, and then under, and build a culture that sees these things as safe to fail. 
because if somebody's going to go away and do an experiment, a bunch of those experiments are not going to work. And that's good. Like you, you, that's how you learn. You learn by doing stuff that both works and stuff that fails. So you know where to go and where not to go. So build a culture in which you can look at that and go, yes, we failed. Success. Um, th th that, that, that's how I would do it. Uh, so the question is, uh, should the process of discovery be different between uh, small companies who are looking to kind of get in and other big companies that are looking to innovate? And the answer is yes. Um, there are power dynamics at play, uh, and it depends how you want to act uh, and the capital that you have to spend, whether that capital is money, it's talent, it's knowledge, it's market position. The way that you would approach your experimentation is going to be different because the things that are safe for you to do are going to be different. Now, a lot of big companies say, oh, we're going um, to create a new wing as a startup. How often do you see that go and think that worked really well? Because they're still in, it doesn't tend to work that well because they're still embedded in the power structures and the capital and the politics of the bigger company, almost always. And not always, I can think of something that went actually very well, but that's usually the case. And I don't think it's something that we should necessarily deny. We should lean into it. We should understand where we are and where we want to go and then think about how we're going to get there. So I think, yes, it absolutely should be different. Uh, and it really depends on the exact companies you're, you're going to talk about there. But yes, you should exploit the, the advantages you have and look to your disadvantages uh, and try to turn them into learning. This sort of judo maneuver stuff that we sometimes talk about. Fantastic. Thank cool. you so much for that, Gary. Thank you.